here's your host of Shaping Success, Wes Tankersley. What is up, everyone? Welcome to Shaping Success. I'm your host, Wes Tankersley. Thank you for taking the time to tune in. If you're watching this live, please do me a big favor. Start a watch party. If you're listening to this on the podcast, do me a favor, like, share, and review it. Help me to grow the show. If you tag me, it'll help me to find you. I'll respond, and I'll send you a nice sticker pack. Today, we have a special guest named Maria Daniels. She's a podcaster and also a self-proclaimed serial entrepreneur who has her hands in a lot of things. So welcome to the show, Maria. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's exciting to have you on. I, you know, I got into the Indie Pods group and then I start seeing you everywhere. It seems like you do a live show every single day. Is that kind of what you're firing up right now? Um, we're not doing one every day. Right now we have three scheduled live shows a week. And then we'll pop in with some one-offs here and there, just depending on everybody's schedules. But there are three live shows going on every single week now, which has been kind of a crazy plan because I didn't just start one. I was just like, I was like, Let's, I'm going to do these three shows now, which is kind of ambitious. You know, as you know, you know, running a podcast, just getting guests, getting the schedules and all that. But I'm kind of one of those people who go big or go home. So it's like, I was like, I'm going to do it and make it work or it'll just crash and burn. And then I'll just do something else. It'll be fine. Well, it's fun to watch. So that's a good thing. You're entertaining people and you're kind of getting your message out there. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Kind of, you know, like when you grew up, where you grew up and then kind of like through high school. And then we'll start talking about the entrepreneurial side of that whole thing, because there's a big story behind that one. Absolutely. So well, it's funny when people say, where did you grow up? I always say that I grew up in Tennessee, which is true, but I was only there from the time I was about eight until I graduated. Before that, I was everywhere. We moved around. Um, my dad was not in the military. Everybody always asks, you know, or were you a military brat? And I wasn't. But my dad worked as a lineman and he worked for a contractor and we moved around and, you know, we went with him. So I lived everywhere up until I was eight. I went to like six different kindergartens. I mean, it, it was crazy. But okay. we finally settled in Tennessee whenever I was eight. Uh, my mom was pregnant with her third child at the time, which was my sister. And she pretty much gave my dad the ultimatum. I'm not moving with another kid. <laughs> so my dad um, actually looked for a job locally there and got on with the local utility board. And so we um, settled there in the eastern part of Tennessee, right outside of Knoxville up until I graduated. And then I came to Ohio, which is ironically where my parents grew up. So I live I like two minutes from where my parents grew up, which is hysterical that I ended up back here. But yeah, so I graduated and I was going to college in Scioto County, which is Shawnee State University for a while until I ended up switching and going online because I always tell this story. It's, it's uh, I grew up in a Southern Baptist family. So my first year I get pregnant. And so it's pretty much like in our family, it's like shotgun wedding. So it's like, oh, you're pregnant. When's the <laughs> wedding? And we're like, uh, next month. <laughs> so we got married to kind of fix that problem. And it was kind of like the rest of history. But you know, it's funny, just kind of the path this life takes you on. It ended up being one of the best things that's happened. It's not only because I love my child, but also because, you know, it, it made me have to be a little bit more resourceful, made me have to think outside of the box. You know, I still wanted to be able to go to school. I still want to be able to get an education. And I still wanted to be able to do all these things. But then I had this whole new set of responsibilities as a parent. And, you know, that I think actually enabled me to be able to dream bigger. I mean, I know a lot of people think, oh my gosh, you know, you're a, you're a teen mom. How did you ever? And I mean, there were definitely lots of bumps in the road. Don't get me wrong. You know, if you listen to my podcast, I share all the details of all the stuff, the stories of all the things. That's just the kind of become my brand is literally being completely real, raw and authentic and telling all the things. But all in all, I really think that that has been something that's kind of made me who I am because I'm able to see things in such a way that I don't think that I would have would have if I had had, you know, the quote unquote easy road, you know. Yeah. And it's interesting because I don't know that I had the easy road, but I know that I had a more structured kind of road and I could see like I got married when I was 19 but we didn't have kids until for 13 years later. So you throw a kid in there being really young. I mean, you're not even barely graduated high school and you got to figure things out. So I can only imagine how crazy that is. But what kind of pushed you towards starting a business? I mean, what made you think, well, you know what? College isn't for me because I kind of wasted my time. I went back to college and I got two degrees and I'm like, then I found it. And this was two yeah. years ago. How was it so easy to figure that out? Or oh, it not definitely easy. wasn't easy. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it definitely was yeah. not easy, but it was interesting. Yeah. It's, it's funny because my first business, I didn't even really count as a business until later on because, you know, I grew up poor. I mean, you know, we did not have a lot of money up until dad started working there in Tennessee. You know, he used to get laid off every fall and winter. So we were like, we had no money. And so I never knew entrepreneurs. I never knew that term. I don't even know if that was a term whenever we were a kid, but I didn't know business owners. You know, to me, a business owner was somebody that had, you know, got a degree, worked in an industry for 30 years, you know, saved up money and started their own business in the same industry that they had been working in for 30 years. To me, that's what it was. So I didn't even really realize that that was an option. Um, I ended up starting working on my own as an entrepreneur, I didn't even know that's what I was doing, which was funny. I was just trying to do something to make some extra money because again, I was a young mom. I was trying to finance doing my own schooling and my current husband at the time was working and I surprised ended up pregnant again. So within 15 and a half months, I had two children and I was young too. So it was kind of one of those things that I started, I actually went to school while I was going to school. I went to school to be a personal trainer also and was working as a trainer, ended up doing MMA for a while, training MMA fighters for a while. I mean, I ended up doing all these like side hustles and I didn't count it as a business because it wasn't something that I was planning to do forever. It was kind of like something to finance what I was planning to do forever at the time. So it's funny, I started doing that in... um 2000. And, you know, I, I, I still have a wellness company. now. I don't train MMA fighters anymore. My, I'm too old. I've had seven children and my body can't <laughs> take that anymore. But I do still have a wellness company that focuses mainly on nutrition and all that. But I mean, it's funny just how your life kind of takes you around. Um, I ended up getting divorced. Me and my ex-husband ha ended up having four children total together. And we ended up getting divorced after almost nine years of marriage. And I found myself, you know, I had been working still as a trainer and, and I found myself trying to figure out what the heck I was going to do. And I had, you know, got, I had finished a degree through mail. This shows my age. They didn't even have the online school at the time. It was all mail order, but I had not actually worked in that industry up to that point. So, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm divorced. I have four children, four young children. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do? Cause I mean, I was making decent money for a second income, but not to raise four children by myself. So I started thinking, okay, well, maybe I'll go back and take some more relevant classes because it was in business management and marketing, which obviously marketing changes by the second. So I was like, well, maybe I'll go back and take some more relevant classes. So I did. I went to to American Marketing Association, took some more relevant classes, um, started working. Actually, I worked for a promotional company first for a while until I went to work for a large marketing industry. And I mean, I loved it. It was, it was great in a lot of ways. Um, I you know, got to the point I was making decent money. And to me, I was following this path, finally, this path to success that I thought that I needed to chase for so long. But I kept hitting roadblocks because I didn't really know the path. I'd never really seen a good example of the path. You know, nobody in my family had followed that path. So once I got to the point I was making, you know, decent money, I was like, finally, you know, I've made it, I've arrived, you know, this is it, you know, type of thing. But there was just something missing still. And I couldn't really put my finger on it. But, you know, by that time, I'd already got remarried. We had had one child together who was autistic. He's high functioning on the autism spectrum, but he's autistic. And, you know, I was to the point that I was like, okay, well, this isn't really working in my life anymore. It's like, I didn't know how to make my commitments at work, make it to work on time. Cause I've got this child with special needs that needs a lot more than any of my other kids ever did. So, you know, I ended up deciding to leave. And at first I was just freelancing. Cause I didn't know what to do. You know, I, I felt actually at that point, I didn't leave because I was like, Oh, I had this great dream and this great idea. It was more like, I felt like I had to, like, I, I felt like it was like, okay, well, this is not working for my life anymore. I'm going to go ahead and just leave and then figure out what the heck I'm going to do. So I started freelancing for a while. And, you know, what I started to find was I had never really put um, a big emphasis on the fact that I was so resourceful until I did start freelancing. I started freelancing and a lot of these business owners were like, wow, how would you think to do that? And I'm like, I don't know. I've had to figure stuff out my entire life. And it wasn't until then that really I started thinking, okay, well, you know, this is obviously benefit to a lot of these companies, you know, that I can think outside of the box, that I can problem solve, that I can, you know, bootstrap. It doesn't always cost the big dollars. I can tell you what you need to do if you have a super small budget or sometimes no budget at all. You know, it, I just was able to kind of start to figure out some of these superpowers that I didn't even realize I had because it wasn't in any of the classes I had ever taken. And, you know, it, I worked like that for a while. And then I started getting so busy. It was actually my CPA that was like, you're either going to have to 
slow down a little bit or you're going to have to make this an LLC. So I decided to make an LLC and kind of went from there. But I didn't tell my story for a long time because it's not one of those like overnight success. It's not one of those like pretty stories that people tell. And there's a whole lot more to my story that we're not going to get into here, but you're more than welcome to kind of get on. I tell it all on my podcast over, you know, different times, but not everybody has this like storybook story, you know, this beautiful, gorgeous story that's just like, oh, and I did this and it was so great. And I did this and it was so great. And my story wasn't like that. My story was a lot of trips and falls. And some of them were because of me and some of them were because of things that were completely outside out of my control because I've led a very chaotic life, you know, some by my design and some outside of my design. So it's like, it was kind of one of those things that when I started my LLC, you know, I had been busy, but it was a whole different thing. You know, I had never owned a real business. You know, I'd worked, you know, in the nutrition and in, you know, training and all that, but it was completely different than running a company, right? And my only experience with a company was working for corporate companies. So being the person that has no idea and also being the person that's terrible at asking for help, I was like, ah, I'll figure it out. You know, I'll be fine. <laughs> you know, I'll figure it out. <laughs> so it's like, you know, I tell people and I run into people that we work with now that's the same way. It's like you start a business because of the one or two things you do like amazingly. And it definitely does not mean that you do all the things amazingly. And, you know, there's a few things that you should never try to do unless you're in those industries. And, you know, obviously those are like legal services, you know, bookkeeping and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, there's some things that it's okay to kind of bootstrap it as you go and figure it out as you go. But, you know, there are certain times and places that you do need to kind of delegate and ask for help. And I think that's a hard thing, um, especially with super small businesses to try to figure out where that point was. and you know, for me, it ended up being one of those things that, you know, I made great decisions, like, like most people, and I made terrible decisions. And I decided during that time, I, I couldn't find good examples of people that were saying, you know, I did this, and that was stupid, or you know what I mean? I should have done it like this, but I didn't. That was really stupid. I couldn't find that. I kept finding, you know, all these stories where it was like, well, you do this. And then I made, you know, 20k this month, and I did this, and I did that. And you know, and those are fine and dandy. It's whatever. I mean, it's great to hear that those are possibilities, but that wasn't what I was needing. I was needing, you know, something that was more real and more, you know, it was telling that there were struggles because I was questioning myself this whole time because, you know, at this time, I've got five kids and I just was given birth to my sixth kid. Um, so I've got five, five kids, one's on the spectrum, have a newborn baby, and I'm trying to figure out my entire life at that point, like, oh my God, you know. Yeah, because he was a surprise. He was not a planned occurrence. <laughs> so he was a surprise. So, you know, I'm sitting there figuring out my whole life. And I was I kept questioning myself, what did I do? You know, I was making good money. You know, I had security. And now I'm trying to figure out what the heck to do. And my everyday, there's no control in my everyday. I had, you know, no way to control what my autistic son was going to be like that day, because he could be completely fine one day, you wake up the next day, and he's a different kid. Sometimes he'd wake up from a nap, and he'd be a different kid. So, you know, it was very challenging trying to figure all this stuff out. And I kept, you know, I would watch things and listen to things and read things. I mean, some things were inspirational and very helpful, but I wasn't seeing good examples of people that that looked like me, right? That what that was like their life was chaos and there was no getting out of it. Other than stepping away from my family and never looking back, which obviously wasn't an option, there was no getting out of my chaos. There just wasn't. So, you know, I was able to work through a lot of the stuff and was able to figure some stuff out and it worked for me, but when it's, I started to see some success in things, you know, I made the decision that I was going to really start to be raw and real and authentic. Not that I was completely lying before, but I was wearing this mask, right? I was wearing this mask where I didn't want everybody to see my dirty laundry. I didn't want anybody to see how much I struggled because to me, I thought that would completely make it to where nobody would want to do business with me. It's like, okay, that chick's a hot mess. You know, we don't want to do business with her. But in reality, once I started to really come out and tell my full story and, you know, it actually had the opposite effect. Now, I'm sure there's some people it's like that chick's weird and sarcastic and we don't want to work with her and that's fine. Those aren't my people anyway. But for the people <laughs> that are my people, it's actually, you know, been a benefit because I've been able to identify with other people, um, especially women who are trying to juggle family and, you know, a spouse and just, just all the things and they're questioning themselves. I've been able to really identify with that. And then, you know, I've got a lot of experience with other bigger companies and my track record proves, you know, all of that with them. So, I mean, all in all, it, it's kind of been one of those things that I don't think every, like for everybody, I don't think everybody would be okay sharing all the details of all the things. But for me, I felt like it was something that I had to do. Um, it was something I felt called to do. And that's exactly, you know, one of the reasons that I do that with my podcast. 
Well, and I think it's amazing. I mean, you sit there and you, you're talking about all this. I, I have one child and I look at that as that's a lot of work. I can't imagine having seven, having an autistic one, and then having all these things going on at one time. You know, you talked a little bit about kind of making your podcast a business, but that's one of the other things that you have going on. How many businesses do you have going on at one time right now? Because we talked about how you kind of just like start throwing stuff on the wall and seeing which stick. How many you got going on at once? Actual businesses, five. Now, that right. being said, the way that I end up doing things is if I come up with an idea, well, I have a process on trying to figure out if my idea is tangible because I am one of those visionaries, like a lot of entrepreneurs that comes up with ideas for all the things, <laughs> right? You know, we have all these ideas like, oh, that's a great idea. Oh, right. that's a great idea. And that can kind of clutter the mind. So I have a brain dump journal that I use. And if stuff comes to my mind, I literally write it down. I, I'm not going to make a decision on it. I'm not going to decide to do it or not to do it right now. I'm just going to put it in my brain dump journal. And I actually schedule times with myself to look over that journal and I'll look at it and decide, okay, you know, that's the dumbest idea ever, which that happens a lot. I'm like, what the heck was I thinking? That's stupid, you know? Or, you know, there's sometimes like, okay, well, that's got some merit. It doesn't maybe have merit for now because I don't really have the time to put into it, but I have another place that I kind of move it over into another journal for later of tangible ideas to look at at another time. So, you know, I have a process to kind of figure out my own ideas, but you know, if I have one that ends up being put in the brain dump that goes into the tangible that I decide to start to work on, I end up establishing that as a DBA under one of my businesses, depending on where it fits the best. And I run it like just a brand under it for a little bit, just to beta test it out to see if it's even worth pursuing into a full business. And then I'll move it off and break it off. And I mean, there's been things that I've tried that was really dumb because I actually hated the industry. I'll give you an example. I started a boutique randomly. Now, that seems like it's like, oh, she's female. She, you know, has a boutique. But see, I'm not one of those women that I don't know how to do makeup. I don't know how to fix hair. I don't know what's in style because most of them don't care. I'm usually in yoga pants, some type of athletic clothes, unless I have to go to a business meeting and I need to wear something different. But, you know, I've always been in athletics and just that's who I am. So it's hilarious that I just, I get this random, it's because I seen the, the financial um, perk in my area to be able to do it. I, was, I put it online. I was actually doing decent with it. And but I hated it. Um, I luckily was able to get out from under that and sold it. <laughs> but, you know, I tell people, you know, you have to have a passion for it. And I think, you know, I started that business not because I had a passion is because I seen the dollars potential. And that's not always bad. But it'll eat you up because it was eating me up because I hated it. I actually absolutely right. hated it. I didn't want anything to do with it. But then at that, by the time I figured that out, that I was like, this was stupid. Why'd I do that? I'm like, I've got a, you know, a boutique, you know, I actually had it in the front of the building that I have here, you know, and I didn't know what to do with it because at that point I had spent so much money, but in the inventory in there, I was like stuck. Right. And everybody was like, Oh, you know, they, they want to come in. It's like, how, how do you quit something once you start it? It's actually super hard or it was for me, but luckily and I say luckily, because it doesn't usually happen like this. I had somebody that wanted to buy it. And I was like, yes, please, <laughs> please buy it for me. <laughs> because I don't want to. So, I mean, it's just, it's funny how those things happen. And I talk to a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs that, you know, they're the same way. Most entrepreneurs are very much visionaries. You know, we're always thinking of things to do. And I am also one of those people that I look at one thing and try to figure out, well, how can I make, you know, multiple streams of revenue out of this one thing? That's just something that I do. I just automatically do that. And that's how the boutique thing happened is because I got this building and, you know, I just, I was trying to decide how to you know, monetize the building in multiple ways. And I had this section up front that I didn't know what else to use it for. And I was doing some little boutique crap online, decided to put it there. And I was just kind of like, it's, it's one of those decisions. Like once you've made it, you're like, I'm stuck. <laughs> you know? yeah. But you know, all in all, I mean, it's, it's, I'm not sorry that I tried it. It definitely taught me some lessons. And I think that's the biggest thing to tell a lot of people who are entrepreneurs. You know, sometimes you're going to jump, you know, you're going to make these decisions. And even when you look back and they're really stupid, you know, um, I learned a lot from that. I learned a lot from owning the boutique. I learned a lot about not only myself, I learned a lot about that industry, which has helped because we've ended up with boutiques that we've done, you know, marketing and social media for, which has helped me a lot because I've been in the industry. And, you know, sometimes you're going to try to do things that is just for a moment. And sometimes it's going to be things you're supposed to do forever. And I've had a lot of those things that even though they were only, you know, for that moment, quote unquote, you know, they ended up being something that taught me lessons that I've, I'm still using now. 
Yeah, and I think that it's awesome that you were able to just kind of decipher through that. I don't. I think that that's the biggest thing. Like a person like me, you know, I went to I went and I worked for a company for eleven years and just kind of was stuck there. That's where I'm going to be. You know, getting a paycheck for someone, working for someone, being okay with that, going back to college, working for someone again. And I would have way rather had it the other way where I tried a bunch of things and figured out what worked for me because I know that I would have been a lot more happier in what I'm doing. So now I'm in this position where I'm trying to figure that out. And you've got that jump start on, you know, someone like me. We're the same, we're pretty close to the same age. And then you've already got that jump start where it kind of works like that. So I'm starting a podcast and we were talking about it the other day. My mindset was I was just create, create, create. And you're like, well, when I start it, I'm going to make it a business. I'm going to do it the same way that I do everything else. So how did you create a business out of a podcast? Because I know most people who are doing these podcasts, they're like, well, I'm just going to get a lot of people to listen and then someone's going to sponsor me and that's how it's going to happen. You looked at it another way. I'm going to make money right away. How did you do that? Well, it's funny. I didn't really know that that's not how you did it. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I, you know, I've been a, I've been a speaker. So I was doing live speaking engagements. And, you know, I actually had somebody say that I should start a podcast and I didn't have any experience with podcasting. Honestly, at that time, I had maybe listened to a handful of podcasts. Um, I've always been in music. I love music. So if I was in the car, I was listening to music. And if I you know, was in the office and I was listening to something, you know, I would put on, you know, some type of continuing education or something I was listening to, but it was very rarely a podcast. Honestly, it was typically I would click on YouTube or something, which in retrospect, now I know some of those may have been podcasts. I don't know. But honestly, I didn't even really know much about podcasting. It's, that's what's so funny. But somebody was like, Oh, you should start a podcast and me being the person I am. I'm like, Oh, yeah, I'll start a podcast. Okay. You know, knowing nothing about it. And I jokingly right. call myself an accidental podcaster because it, I am. I'm an accidental podcaster because I was like, well, I'll try it. Yeah, let's try that. So I assumed everybody did it like this. You know, it's like, okay, well, I've got this new, you know, thing I'm going to do. I established it, like I was mentioning earlier, like I do every new thing I'm trying as a DBA under my consulting company. I was like, okay, well, this will be a mar- marketing leg under my consulting company. And what I'll do is I will partially share my journey as an entrepreneur and I'll talk to other entrepreneurs and the whole thing will be mainly about just, and I call it successfully chaotic because that was relevant to my own life, you know, just trying to be successful in the midst of the chaos. And, you know, but I wanted to go deeper than that. I wanted to, and I had been to, I had done a couple of speaking engagements. I had titled successfully chaotic, which was kind of, you know, why I ended up using that same one. But um, it, the idea was even deeper than the, the idea of finding success. It's also defining your own success, defining your success for yourself, not chasing somebody else's idea of success, which was what I was doing for so many years. You know, it was defining what does success look like to me? You know what I mean? What does that look like to me? Not to somebody else. And even in the middle of that, also figuring out, okay, well, not everybody's journey is going to look the same. So everybody's brand of chaos is going to look different, right? You know, your brand of chaos is going to look different than my brand of chaos. But at the end of the day, chaos is chaos. And you have to try to figure out how to kind of make it through that. So, you know, I kind of wanted to go that level. And then, you know, as we mentioned, I've kind of multifaceted like a lot of other entrepreneurs on what I like to do. So I wanted to also touch on relationships and touch on, you know, the fact that I've been in the wellness industry because we're all very layered, you know, humans are layered. And I always use that phrase from like Shrek where he talks about that, you know, ogres are like onions, they have layers. I'm like, people, you know, are like (laughs) onions, they have layers. And part of the thing I think that drove me so crazy about myself for so long is I felt like I had to keep all these separate boxes. It's like, well, this was my work box. And this was my mom box. And this was, you know, my wife box. And this was, you know, I had all these separate boxes. Yeah, I, I would try to compartmentalize everything. And it was actually driving me insane. Because you know, they leak out, they leak over into each other. You know, they don't stay where they're supposed to. I can be in the office and I get a call from my 15 year old because she decides that she needs this new kind of contacts. I mean, it's like, you know, your life bleeds into each other and there's really no real way of completely stopping it. So for me, I wanted to kind of talk about all of those things because as an entrepreneur or even just as a person, you know, you have all these things that come up in life. And if we're going to actually live a successful life, we have to find out how really to address all of those things. And, you know, you hear that that work-life balance term all the time. And that, that was another thing that I wanted to make sure and touch on. Because when you have a business, you know, you're always trying to balance work and life and work and life and work and life. Because especially when you're starting your business out, you're working all the hours and doing all the things, right? But I think for me, it was really defining that there was never going to be a complete balance. And that was hard. 
you know, balancing, it wasn't ever going to be this like equal magical time where the clouds parted and the angels sang, you know, it's going to be more like, okay, well, it's just like a giant balloon game. That's what I always t- say that it's kind of just like you're playing this giant balloon game where you got all these balloons in the air and you're just trying not to let them hit the ground. Do you ever play that as a kid? The balloon game? Yeah. I mean, that's I'm really like it. I mean, that's literally how life is. Yeah. You're just like bumping them up because there's going to be some times where your personal life is going to be extra hectic and it's going to take more of your time. And then you know, if you spend too much time only focusing on that, you're professional life will start to fall, you know, it'll start to sing down just like that balloon. And the key is to keep it popped up enough to where it doesn't completely hit the ground. Because, you know, just as soon as that happens, it's going to be your business is taking more time, and then your family is going to start to sink down, and you're going to have to pop that back up too. And, you know, for me, it's understanding that that is work life balance, that it's never going to be equal 50 50 balance. And that was actually very freeing once I remembered that and realized that. And I wanted to make sure that, you know, I helped other people kind of find balance for themselves. So, you know, that's that, and all in all, that's what it is, is working with entrepreneurs and speaking on different topics and then helping anybody that's listening through whatever they're going through at that time, depending on the topic. So, I mean, that it's been. Honestly, it's been a passion project and being able to make money off of it, I guess, is a is a perk, because honestly, when you start a business, money is a goal as far as at least breaking even. But it has been more of a passion project for me than anything. But I did. I did. I guess I really didn't realize that everybody wasn't running it like a business. (laughs) Up until yeah. like semi recently, honestly, because I thought everybody was like, oh, okay, well, I'm doing this thing. I want to be legally protected. You know, I want to make some money off of it, at least to be able to pay my expenses and at least break even, right? You don't want to go in the hole. Nobody wants to go in the hole, you know? And I didn't realize until it wasn't that long ago that that was not the norm for the podcasting world. And honestly, that's kind of been, we've taken a little bit of a shift with our company as far as, you know, when I started my podcast um, and, you know, a lot of businesses we had worked with seen that, you know, they started asking me to help them start their podcast, you know, and, and I'm, I've, I've told them I'm not a podcasting expert. That's not what I am, but I am somebody that can, that can tell you the steps you need to take. And I also bring, I, we have a team of people that we're bringing in to do like editing and some different things with these businesses who, especially last year, needed to jump and do something quick to be able to still be relevant in the market. So, you know, and that's kind of segued to figuring out that a lot of podcasters were not running their podcast like a business that now we have a DBA um, called Podcast Sauce, which kind of goes with that. We have another DBA called Marketing Sauce that is kind of like a brand. And we called called this one Podcast Sauce. And it's kind of helping podcasters be able to monetize their podcast without... I mean, there's nothing wrong with ads. I'm not against ads. I mean, I'm really not. But to me, that's a bonus. That's kind of like the sprinkles. On, it's not even the icing on the cake. It's the sprinkles on the cake. So, right. you know, you really need to look at other ways to be able to make money from your podcast other than advertising. Because, you know, if you're doing advertising correctly, in my opinion, in any way, on your podcast, it needs to be relevant to, to your podcast, to your listeners, and to what you like. You know what I mean? Don't I, I always get annoyed when people reach out to me and want me to put an ad or to sponsor something or to refer something to my clients. I'm like, I wouldn't use this. Why would I tell my clients to use it? Right. I wouldn't use it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so. And that's kind of the biggest thing that say. we get into right now is the fact that that's, that's really what it is. It's like, I, here I am sitting with this hat and the shirt on. This is me. This is the type of person that I am. Now, when I go into my job on a daily basis, I have to look a little bit different. You know, I got the collared shirt on yeah. and my hair combed and I'm walking into a business and this is what I want. And when you try to tell me that I have to show something or advertise something that I don't believe in, in the same way, even when I'm selling something to someone, if I don't think it's a good product, it's really hard for me to sell it to them. So yeah, running those ads isn't really, it's not great if you're not back behind it and people can tell like with me anyway, I'm, I kind of wear it. Like I'll I'll be advertising for someone, but it's kind of like, if I don't like it, I'm not going to push it as hard as I could. Whereas Mm -hmm. with something that I love, then it would be a whole different story. Yeah. So, I mean, all in all, there's, to me, no matter what your subject matter is on your podcast, you'd be surprised the ways that you can monetize it. And I kind of hate the term monetize, but that's what everybody uses. But because anything that you're doing in a business realm, and a podcast is in a business realm, should be run like a business. It should be run, ran with the idea that you're, again, trying to, you're trying to make a profit, but really, I mean, breaking even should be first goal. 
you know, because even if you're bootstrapping all the things with your podcast, they're still expenses, you know, so breaking even should be goal number one. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's was funny to me. Um, the first couple of people that found out that they wasn't, they didn't have it established as a business entity. I was kind of like, hmm, well, that's a mistake, you know? And I started finding out more don't than do. And I don't know, I guess because I've been in the business world now for for a while that I was just kind of like, oh, well, that's, that's, that's scary and dangerous. And I'm, you know, you'll always worry about being sued and I'm always worried about protection and my little bubble. You know? right. So, it's, <laughs> you know, that's what business, you know, having a business helps shield your personal assets. So to me, that was a no brainer. And, and, you know, I, it, it's funny because people will be like, oh, you run it like a business. I'm like, yeah, I mean, I don't understand any other way. So, you know, when you ask that, I, I mean, I guess I, I laugh because it's not like I pre thought it out. I just did it the way that I thought everybody was doing it. I didn't even know there was another option, honestly. Well, it's a great way to do that. So if, if anyone wanted, you said you have a, you call it podcast sauce. If anyone wanted to yeah, reach out to you for that, how would they get a hold of you to kind of get some coaching on how to do that and things like that? That's a newer DBA. So we're just getting everything put up there. So it's kind of like sad and pathetic right now. But you can still contact us through the consulting company, which is Reset Business Consulting. Um, you can also find me obviously through the podcast through Successfully Chaotic. But yeah, we, we've just got that up. We beta tested it out with a few people before we really started building the site. And the site's kind of up. It's just kind of sad right now. Um, and I just put a Facebook page up the other day. And I think it's got like I don't know, not very many people, like 40 or something on it. I just put it up <laughs> the other the way day. it always starts, right? But, <laughs> yeah. So it's just kind of one of those things that we're, we're laying everything out. But we were already doing, we were doing it on the, on the uh, consulting company side with businesses. And then podcasters started coming over there. And I thought it made more sense because, you know, when you're marketing something, obviously you're talking to a particular group of people. And the way that I talk about it to a business is not necessarily the same way I'm going to talk about it to someone that's already podcasting. So to me, it made more sense to break it off into a DBA just for clarity. So that's how that happened. Because people, you know, it's really the same thing. I mean, it's the same thing that we're doing. You're roughly the same thing, basically, most of the things are. But, you know, it's, it's more that, you know, this is going to be crafted, especially wording. wording. Wording is really important. So it'll be crafted more toward people who are already podcasting and maybe don't know the business world. So you talk about certain phrases and stuff with them. They're not going to know what you're talking about. And I think clarity right. is, a, is, a, is a big thing when you're wanting people to take action and you're wanting people to you know, be able to get the best results possible, they need to understand it because if they don't understand it, they can't do it. And you know, affordability was also a big thing because businesses have a bigger budget than a podcast does. You know, so right. I wanted to make sure that it was something that was super affordable. And we even do a few, we've done a couple of them, just um, workshops, free workshops that we give the basics, you know, give some basic information on what they can do to get it set up. And um, then, you know, they can reach out if they want to go further, because I, I don't know, I feel the need to be able to help everybody be able to establish it in their podcast in such a way that is not only serving their listeners, but serving themselves too. Because I mean, all in all, again, even if it's just breaking even, because all of us love it. You know, I, everybody that I talk to that's a podcaster, we love it. And it's like, yeah, I totally do it for free because you would, but free isn't necessarily free because we have all the expenses related to it. So, you know, my right. number one goal I tell people is get protected. So establish your LLC and make sure that you're legally protected, that if you get on there and somebody gets really mad that you should have said this, but you said this, and they try to sue you, they're not suing you, Wes. They're suing the podcast, which still sucks. And I mean, I'm not going to say it doesn't, but still better than suing you and all your assets, right? Um, right. So being able to establish all that, I think is super important. And then number two, at least break even, at least get to the point where, you know, you're able to monetize to the point of paying for your monthly services, paying for, you know, your, your equipment, you know, all of that, because that should be the very basic goal. So that's what we we're trying to work with people to do. And I don't know, that's become kind of, again, a, pa a passion project to do that because I've, I see the need there. Yeah. And it's a great audience. I mean, I think that you're you're you've got a lot of different things that you're working on with that. With uh, you're the moderator on a couple groups. You're doing your live shows and things like that. So it's kind of one of those things where you do you just got to protect yourself so that that happens. Absolutely. So as far as 
what's going on now, you're working on the podcast business as well as helping other people to do that. Is there anything else that you have coming down the pipe? I know that you have, like we talked about, you have lots of irons in the fire, but is there anything other than that coming up for you? Wow, well, we've, we've always got, I've always got stuff going on. If you would, if I was in my <laughs> office, you'd see my board. It's completely got all the things on it. But um, we're doing another um, Indie Pods, a summer edition. I don't know if you've seen that um, coming up this summer. So we've been meeting and working on that. So that's coming up. Um, I'm also in the middle of planning a, a business summit um, with Tim Kroll. I don't know if you know him. He's all, he has a podcast too called The Business Adventurist. And you know we're putting together a summit that'll also be this summer. So those are two things. Um, obviously, our live shows, they launched out three weeks ago, I think. One is called Talk Creative to Me. And that's another thing I mentioned earlier. I've been in, in music. I've sang in bands and, you know, different things for years now. And the creative industry was completely just pummeled last year. <laughs> you know, nobody was performing. Um, and, you know, I felt kind of the push in the to be able to give them a platform to do something. So we decided to put together this live show called Talk Creative to Me. And we've got some panel members, Jeff Perini from The Yo Show, um, Zach Wiseman from um, Some Nobodies, and then Tina Marie Trimpert from the Psychedelic Podcast and also a member of Indie Pods, obviously. So we've got that pulled right. together and we're bringing on just different creatives and talking to them about, you know, what they're doing, about their creative processes, because we wanted it to be kind of a learning experience and to be able to introduce, you know, who's doing what. And then we've got some fun events and stuff planned throughout the year to be able to kind of get people, you know, involved in trying these different creative arts and stuff. So you know, we've had some fun stuff so far. We've had um, so a voiceover actor. Um, Maccabee Griffin. And then we had Jess Paul. And if you know her, but she's amazing. She's an actress. And she also um, makes this really creative, it's like fun food. It's her YouTube channel is This Is Jess Paul. And, and you have to go check it out. I mean, she's, she does some amazing stuff. She, it looks completely like real food. So she started making <laughs> it just, um, you know, just for fun. Some of it's wearable. It's just super cool. Anyway, we had her on, which I'm all like, I need to make that now. So it'll probably be bad. I'll <laughs> buy all the supplies. I'll be trying it. But yeah, we've had, you know, just some cool people. Um, this coming week, we've got Chris Harvey, which is a comedian. He'll be on uh, this Thursday, which this will be airing later, but this Thursday, February 11th. So, you know, if when somebody's listening to this later, you can still go back and listen on our YouTube channel, um, Successfully Chaotic or Facebook page. So it's, I don't know, it's been fun doing all that and um, throwing together, you know, um, Business Acceleration Playbook, which is our our business specific live show just, you know, continuing that trainings and stuff for entrepreneurs. It's just, I'm always trying to find things. My, my goal at the end of the day, you know, if I was to kind of dial it all back is, and I guess I've had to sit and think about this because it, it's, and that's how I make the decisions on what I'm trying to do and what I'm not going to try to do is it always has to dial back to the same thing is, well, two things. Is it going to make me happy, improve my life somehow, make me happy, number one. And number two, am I being a helper? Because, you know, people ask me like, why are you in so many different industries? Because, you know, if you was to look at my, and I think I mentioned this to you whenever we were doing our interview a while back, but if you was to look at my resume, it looks completely bipolar, it really does. But, you know, the, <laughs> some of it is just because it was like, oh, I, I'm going to try this because I'm broke and I need some money, you know, early on. But then later on, it wasn't because of that. It was because I wanted to try new things and I wanted to try to be able to be of service. I see the need, I see the problem and I want to see if I can help, you know, because I've been in some super low places. I've been that person struggling. I've been the person not sure what to do. And I wanted to make sure that nobody else was ever in that place again. And when, if they were, that there was a light at the end of that tunnel. So at the end of the day, as long as I'm being of service and I'm being a helper and it's improving my life too, then it's a winner. Yep. Well, the podcast is called Successfully Chaotic. I think that you should check it out if you are listening to this or watching this, because I think it's, it's a great, it's, it's similar to mine, whereas we're just trying to help other people be, you know, show that success is different for everyone. With that being said, you know, with respect for your time and everything, we have one last question that we ask every single guest. It's been awesome having you on here to kind of talk about it yeah. because I think that there's a lot of great things that you have going on. I think it's crazy to me. Like I said, I have one child and I can't imagine doing it with seven. So you <laughs> really are pushing through and following your dreams, which is awesome. Um, and congratulations on that because I, I know I would be insane. I'd probably be in a mental institution. Oh, I'm, I'm I insane. To do that. I am, I am insane. Yeah. <laughs> I, I use sarcasm and humor to get through all that. So. Well, the last question that we always ask is, and I think you kind of alluded to this a little bit, but what is the shape of your success? How would you define success for yourself? 
basically freedom. Um, at the end of the day, we all want to be free to pursue the things we're wanting to pursue, to enjoy the things that we want to enjoy. And being able to not have to worry about chasing somebody else's idea of success, um, because it's not the money, the house, the car. And I say this all the time, because I got to the point that I had that, you know, and I mean, I, I still do now. But you know, I had to I, when I stepped out of my job, I was giving up the potentially giving up that because I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to make that money back. But for me, it was the freedom of being able to choose what I wanted to do was so much more important than that. To be able to literally dream things into existence was so much you know, better than that. I wasn't being told, well, you need to do this. You've got to stay in this box. You know, I was able to think of these things that I think of and decide for myself if it was something that I was wanting to pursue, if it was going to add to the enjoyment of my life, if it was going to help other people. And to me, that's success. As long as I can continue to do that, I consider myself successful. That doesn't mean that it's easy. My days are still crazy. And some days are super hard. You mentioned I had seven kids. That just I mean, there's some days <laughs> I'm like, I'm done. Mom's out. But you know, all in all, you know, if I stop and take a look at my life, am I happy? I, and I, I can actually for the first time in forever say I am now. And that wasn't the case for the longest time, because I was miserable. Well, I think it's awesome that you found that. I think that a lot of people, like you talked about, they think that it's all unicorns and rainbows. Everyone has instant success. And I think that that's not the truth. I mean, I think we talked about this before where they see the success part, but they don't see the failure part. And the, par the part that makes people successful is that they're willing to fail over and over again and continue to push towards that goal of what they're looking at. So I think that you're okay. doing that. I want to say thank you for taking the time to be on here. It's been awesome listening to your story and kind of getting to know you more. I hope people will check out your show because I think it's it's along the same lines of mine and it will be completely Absolutely. helpful for them to kind of see what success looks like for other people. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me on. No problem. Hey, thanks everyone. That's the end of the show. I wanted to tell you next time, I challenge you to find the shape of your success. Jeffrey. It's the show featuring. Wednesday. Yep. See, this is, yeah, I got my nerds in the background, but I still got to edit my stuff because that's not much fun Hi, for them. I'm a nerd. <laughs> this is the voice of the king of all nerds. We have a shop full of wizards over here and sub wizards. I like, a, I like nerds and wizards. We have a Harry yeah. Potter corner. Oh, a yeah. Star Wars corner. Harry Potter is my jam. Yeah, I'm one of those people. A Napoleon no Dynamite shame. corner. We have skill. I feel yeah. like I missed that, though. Like, we're about the same age, I think, and I feel like I missed the Harry Potter thing. Like, I didn't read those books. I didn't um, watch those books. I did, but I have kids. So, I mean, oh, my, yeah, kids that's true. Range, my kids range in age from 22 to 4. So, I've kind of yeah. been introduced to all the things. You had no choice in the matter. No. <laughs> I've seen everything. But I actually like that's the Harry Potter. I read the books by choice, too. Oh, that's good. They're that's fun. always fun when you do that. Mm -hmm. They're kind of magical, you know? They are. I keep waiting for my letter. It hadn't happened yet, though. <laughs> have you bought an owl? You have to buy an owl first. I, I want to buy an owl. My husband won't let me. That's an ongoing conversation. I'm happy <laughs> you brought that up because I'm always like, I want to buy an owl. And he's like, no. And I'm like, when well, you die, I'm buying an owl. So, I mean, this is how it's happening. Just go to the <laughs> toy store and buy a rubber owl, sort of like in the I same aisle rubber as rubber owl. chickens. <laughs> I want a real owl. A real owl. Who, who, who wants a real owl? Who? <laughs> the guest is raising her hands. You couldn't see that. But you're going to see yeah. it in five, four, three, <laughs> two, one, zero. Go.